Hi everybody, welcome to a new episode on my channel. Uh, today my guest is Dr. Dale Purves. Dr. Dale Purves is Geller Professor of Neurobiology Emeritus at the Center for Cognitive Neuroscience at Duke University. He was elected to the National Academy of Sciences in 1989 for his work on neural development and synaptic synaptic plasticity, sorry. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. He is author of many books, including Principles of Neural Development and Brains, How They Seem to Work, and also the lead author of textbooks like Neuroscience and Principles of Cognitive Neuroscience. His research during the last 15 years has sought to explain why we see and hear what we do, focusing on the visual perception of lightness, color, form, and motion, and, and also the auditory perception of music and speech. Dr. Purves, thank you a lot for taking the time for to come on the show. Glad to be here, Ricardo. Okay, great. So, uh, the first question I would like to ask you is, uh, would you say that uh, coming from your studies on vision, audition, and other aspects of cognition, uh, and perception in this case, uh, that our senses did not really evolve to allow us to perceive reality as it is, but rather to endow us with the capacity of creating sort of a representation of reality that includes all the aspects that are indispensable for us to solve the relevant problems uh, for us to solve from an evolutionary point of view. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable way of putting it. So the problem is that <clears throat> we biological organisms, and that includes everything from bacteria to us, don't have the measuring devices that can actually reveal reality. So take just the physical dimensions of something, a ruler, for example, or a scale, or a photometer, anything that's a physical instrument that's able to measure the real properties uh, of physical reality. We don't have those kinds of instruments. And as a result, uh, we have to apprehend the world, to deal with the world in a very different way. And that uh, is not so simple to figure out what that way is. It's not like a Tesla car, you know, a driverless car <laughs> moving through traffic that has lots of machinery able to detect the edge of the road, the distance of other vehicles, how fast they're going, whether a pedestrian is in the way, etc. <clears throat> we don't have all that uh, physical machinery. We do it in a different way. And that's a huge challenge for biology to explain that, and that's why I've been working on it for such a, long, <laughs> such a long time. It's a challenge, but it's also fun. I mean, why uh, do we work the way we do, and how, how is it possible? How is it possible to tell, let's say, the length of a line when we don't have a machinery in our visual system or our brains to actually r report that to us as a ruler does, just to take a very simple example. We do it in some other way. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And would you say that the reason why our cognitive systems evolved just to pick up, from, uh, to pick up on some aspects of the information in the world uh, as inputs, let's say, is that if we were to evolve in a way that would allow us to perceive reality as it is, then the amount of information uh, that we would receive and would have to deal with uh, as, an, as an input would be, would be very metabolically demanding for it to even be evolutionary, evolutionarily viable. No, I don't think so. I don't think it's a question of metabolism uh, or efficiency <coughs> of energy use. It's just that we don't have in our visual system, let's take that as an example, which is the example that I've used a lot. We don't have the equivalent of a ruler. When you see a, an object, let's take this pen, and you want to say, well, how, how, what's the length of this pen? 
what's projected onto your retina is a very different length if the pen is angled this way, this way, or this way. So we don't have the simple information that uh, a ruler provides us with. I don't think it's a question of metabolism. We have plenty of energy to do, to do the job. It's just that um, we don't have the instruments. We don't have the instruments. And they're not complicated instruments. I mean, that's why I like the example of a ruler. I mean, everybody can understand that. We don't have a ruler in our heads. We can't measure the length of things. We must get that information that allows us to deal with a pen or anything else in a different way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and from a, an evolutionary point of view, to understand uh, the way our cognitive systems work and how they evolved, would you say that uh, the correct question to pose is uh, what's the problem that each brain or cognitive system has evolved to solve? Yes, it's exactly the way I would put it, and I have put it in that way. <clears throat> I mean, unless you recognize that there is a problem, uh, you can, of course, begin to solve it. When you begin to solve it, you see, well, okay, what are the possibilities? <coughs> what are the possible ways in which we could get around this fundamental obstacle of all of our sensory information being discrepant with physical reality? Obviously, we behave fine, so we, in some sense, and I put in quotation marks, we, we know physical reality, but we don't get it directly. We must know reality in some other way, and that's, uh, I think, the interesting challenge in vision or any other sensory system. And, of course, since, you know, input is such a big part of the system, that's equivalent to saying, yeah, we really need to think about this a uh, problem to understand how the brain works. Um, it's, in principle, a very simple idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. And, and so, uh, the correct way to look at uh, how our cognition works is that we all the time have to make inferences based on the limited information that our brain systems uh, receive as input, right? I don't think so. I mean, that's of course a popular view that we okay. recognize that the information that is coming in is in some way, I mean, this goes back to the 19th century and Helmholtz who was aware of this problem and was the originator of the idea that we need to use inferences to understand uh, the world that's out there. I, I don't think that's what's happening. If you, if you, if you want to make an inference, well, you have to have a, a, a sample. Uh, for example, you want to make an inference about the validity of some medical test. Well, you need a, a sample of how often that medical test is giving you one answer versus another answer, a false positive or, or a positive. And you, you can't infer that without the information uh, about the reality that the test is revealing. We don't have information about the real world, so it's very hard to, to say that, well, we, we have a limited sample, but we can infer what's likely based on that limited sample. We don't have a limited sample of reality. We don't have any sample of reality. That's, I think, the point that I've tried to make. Mm -hmm. Okay, now I understand. So, and uh, how do we make sense of both the fact that the nervous system uh, already has a lot of determined innate structural organization by the time of birth, uh, but that it also allows for a certain degree of flexibility via phenomena of neuroplasticity? Yeah. <coughs> Again, that's a very basic question. So, for me, Evolution is the great teacher, and if you compare the limited ability of our brains through plasticity to learn in our lifetimes, of course, we learn stuff. You've learned stuff, I've learned stuff, we've all learned stuff. But the, uh, the process that's doing the heavy lifting, the mechanism that's doing the heavy lifting is, of course, evolution. So, over life on Earth has been present for about three and a half billion years. So the information that's been accumulated by organisms up to and including us over that evolutionary period has 
incorporated an enormous amount of information in what we get without any experience in the world. That's your question. Why, uh, how is there information in the brain at birth? There's a huge amount. Obviously, the brain has an intricate uh, structure and uh, is enormously well prepared to deal with the world it's going to find. That's done through evolution. What we learn through plasticity, of course, it's important. I mean, we grow up to be, you know, uh, a lawyer or a doctor or a musician or whatever it may be through learning. Uh, you know, it's just a trivial example of many, many things that we learn. But that pales quantitatively in comparison to the evolutionary learning that all of us bring into the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, and so, uh, does it mean that we come innately equipped with cognitive modules or cognitive systems that already contain information, either in terms of structure or even biochemically, uh, encoded in a way or another about the type of problems or the type of information they will have to deal with? Sure. I mean, I think that's obvious from looking across the range of uh, extant animals in the various uh, <coughs> animal kingdoms. So, um, you know, we are uh, obviously prepared for the world as we, we find it, but the variation in what, you know, uh, a mouse needs to know, uh, a gorilla needs to know, homo sapiens need to know, that's enormously different. They all have a niche, they all have to survive in that niche, they have information that prepares them to survive in that niche. It's very difficult, different. I mean, one, I think, way to think about the very large gap between human uh, brain operation and the operation of, let's say, uh, the brain of a mouse, is that we have uh, learning through culture. So the information that's been accumulated through culture, we can learn as you and I have learned in school to do whatever we want to do. That's very different. Uh, other animals have a very limited cultural capacity. We have a lot. Culture is based on social learning. Other animals have some degree of culture, whether it's crows or monkeys uh, or other species, but, but we do that in spades. We have an enormous capacity for cultural learning, and that makes us uh, different in the, in the sense that we don't have to inherit all our knowledge through evolution. We pass it on through books, Google, uh, whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, this information that animals come innately equipped with, is it related to what uh, people who study animal behavior usually call fixed action patterns that we would vulgarly call uh, instincts? Yeah, I mean, those are all tricky words that need to be defined. Uh, I mean, fixed instinct patterns might be better thought of as reflexes. Uh, but, yeah, I, I basically agree with what you're saying. I mean, you could call them give them various names, but they amount to the same thing. Behavior is that we are ready to perform based on evolutionary knowledge of what the world is going to be like in the niche for whatever the species is that we are interested in, and of course mainly we're interested in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, b because in perception and vision and so on, uh, people tend to study a lot illusions, would you say that we should interpret uh, the way our cognitive systems deal with illusions as them being errors of processing, or, 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 I, or are they not really errors? Yeah, that's a good question, Ricardo. I mean, I would take a very different view than the one that you're, you're, you're suggesting. I don't believe there are such things as illusions in the following sense, that everything we see, as I've said before, is discrepant with physical measurements made by rulers, protractors, photometers, etc. So in that sense, everything we see, because it's discrepant with reality, is an illusion. That's more a philosophical point than, than perhaps a practical one. And I think people's interest in illusions has thrown them off the track of understanding what's 
really going on. What's really going on is that we have a, a huge problem, and it's not because we're sometimes fooled by a particular stimulus that a psychologist has prepared to amaze their students. We're fooled all the time, in a sense, because we don't have the, as I've said already several times, we don't have the instruments to measure reality. So we never see reality. We see what the brain makes up that allows us to behave very well in the world, but it's not reality. So illusions is a tricky word. And when I say I don't believe in them, uh, I just think it is a way of uh, getting uh, around the problem or avoiding the problem that is, is really an obvious one. We don't see reality. Everything in that sense is an illusion. Is that a philosophical point? Yeah, it's a philosophical point, but it's important to see it because if you don't see it, well, then you, you know, spend your life looking at particular effects that you're misinterpreting. You're just looking at them in the wrong framework, thinking that they are errors of perception. They're not errors of perception. That's the way we see. That's the way we hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and I would also like to ask you, because I think this is a very important thing for people to understand. Uh, there isn't really any direct connection between perception and behavior because people usually have this wrong idea that, uh, for example, uh, just to give a very quick example, when they're driving their car, most of their action is automatic after they've done their learning, right? And so uh, it, they don't really have to be consciously aware of what's in front of them, let's say, to keep performing their basic uh, automatic behaviors in terms of driving the car, uh, but e e even so, they still have to have their eyes open, otherwise they, they would have an accident, right? So it's it's a bit tricky to, <laughs> to understand these it, things. It right? is a bit tricky. I mean, that raises the problem of consciousness, which again, I think is a very difficult one, but I think the point you're making is absolutely valid, that we are conscious of very little of what we're doing in our daily lives. We're doing automatic things, uh, and that means we're perceiving them perfectly well. We stay on the road when we're driving our car, even though we're thinking about something very different, the fight we had with our wife last night, or whatever it might be. And um, that makes, a, I think, a, again, a very fundamental point that consciousness is kind of overblown, the idea that you have to be consciously aware of something to generate behavior. I regard perception as behavior. A lot of people think that, again, kind of a textbook misconception is that behavior boils down to a motor action, that that's what behavior means, doing something with your uh, the movement uh, of your body in space and time. I, I think that's wrong. I mean, a, pers uh, a behavior is any response to a neural stimulus. Perception is a, a behavior. Emotion is a behavior. Uh, lots of categories of behavior exist in addition to just, you know, motor behavior. So again, no one has to think a little bit more broadly about the, the situation that we're in. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, I understand. Then, could you just please ex explain the concept that you developed in a recent paper of yours that, that is explaining, in this case, vision, but it perhaps could be perception in general, in wholly empirical terms? What do you mean by, yeah. so by what that I expression? What I haven't said in answer to your good questions uh, is, okay, if we don't have the instruments to measure reality, and yet we behave as if we know reality, even though we don't, how are we doing that? Uh, obviously, there's some mechanism that enables to get along in the world and not kill ourselves <coughs> quickly. And the idea of empirical accumulation of in, uh, information is both simple and complex. The simple way of thinking about it is we depend on whether any behavior we execute, any perception we have, any emotion we have, any motor behavior we have, whether it works or it doesn't work. If it works, the circuitry that underlies it, we keep. If it doesn't work, I mean, this is evolution by natural selection. If it doesn't work, we get rid of it. So we're accumulating 
empirical information, both in terms of evolutionary time and personal individual learning time. But either way, we're accumulating that information by trial and error according to what works or what doesn't work. There's no magic. I mean, we don't know what's going to work or our species doesn't know what would work or the antecedents of our species had no idea what would work. But through accumulated experience over in evolution, billions of years showed the right behaviors and the wrong behaviors, so to speak. And in life, the same thing. We figure out based on, for example, dopaminergic rewards, we figure out what's a good behavior and a bad behavior based on the reward that we get from doing it successfully or unsuccessfully. Those are ways of accumulating empirical information. I think the idea, the counter idea that a lot of people have is that, well, the brain is a computer and it's computing online what the behavior is that we need to do in some circumstance. I would say, no, 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 no. I mean, it's hard to think about, but the information is all there. It's all ready to go. All we need to do is trigger it by a stimulus. In that sense, in my view, but not in many other people's, everything we do is a reflex. Literally, every thought that we have, every action that we take, every emotion that we have, every person that we entertain, I would say it's all reflexive in the, in the sense that, and it's an important sense, that the circuitry is already there. All you need to do is trigger it by a stimulus. Stimulus triggers a certain reaction. That's what we do. Uh, and that's why I would say the brain is all about making associations. You know, I, I think I've said this many times to students that for most systems, organ systems that we have, there's a principle. The heart pumps the blood, the lungs oxygenate the blood, the digestive system provides nutrients from the foods we consume. There's no principle equivalent so far to what the brain does. What is it doing? Well, I would say it's just making associations based on the accumulation of empirical information. What works stays, what doesn't work goes over evolutionary and individual time. The result is a massive bunch of associations in our heads that enable us to do uh, incredible things, but they're all based on a very simple associative mechanism. Again, that's a minority opinion, but you asked me, so I'm telling you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> that was the point of it. Uh, so would you say that in order to study the brain and the many cognitive functions that he has uh, in purely, let's say, scientific terms, in this case neuroscientific terms, we should put completely aside, and you already talked a little bit about that, the, no, uh, the difference or the distinction that people tend to make between what is the world or reality itself and the way we perceive it, we perceive it as if they were two distinct entities. Yes, I think that's a good way of, of putting it. I mean, it's inevitable that we look out the windows I'm doing now. Oh, yeah, there's trees and flowers and stuff out there. We can't escape that obvious fact. Fact in the sense that our subjective uh, experience is telling us every moment of every day, that's what's happening. We're experiencing the real world based on our sensory apparatus, but the reality is it's not happening. And that's, I think, a very big step for most people to take in their thinking about how nervous systems work. I mean, it just seems impossible that they would work that way, but again, I think there's lots of evidence for that. I mean, if you get down to the evidence, and ask, well, what is the evidence? You have to explain what we see and the qualities of what we see, whether it's color, brightness, form, motion, all of these basic qualities that we see are phenomena. They have a bunch of phenomenology that's been detailed over centuries as people have studied the psychophysics of what we see here and so on. If you can explain that phenomenology in terms of empiricism, Fine, you make the case. If you can't, you fail. Well, a lot of that phenomenology can and has been explained in terms of empirical accumulation of information that's not about reality. It's just about what works. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and this last question will perhaps be a little bit philosophical, but... That's all uh, philosophical. 
<laughs> yes. You know what Einstein said? He said, there's no good science that doesn't have a philosophical question at its base. And he, he of course, as in so many other things, he was quite right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But but if, if the things we are dealing with uh, from the world outside are the ones we can perceive, uh, even if we are to have an abstract notion that the world is not exactly as we perceive it, uh, because, uh, because the way our cognitive systems operate and compute the information they receive from the outside allow us to have behaviors that are relevant to our survival, reproduction, and so on, in, so they are evolutionarily relevant, then all of these, our, our, the entirety of our cognition and behavior, is, still has something real to it, right? <laughs> well, I mean, the neurobiology is real enough. What's, what's not real is the uh, assumption that we are experiencing the physical reality of the world as its measure. We, we never do, and that's easily demonstrable in, 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 in so many ways, as I've pointed out in lots of books and papers and stuff. I think the other problem that you and everybody else uh, raises in making uh, these kinds of arguments is that the brain is computing something. Again, I don't think because of what I've said that it's based on the accumulated information that's ready to go when the stimulus triggers it, that's not a computation, that's just a reflexive response. So online computation, I would say that there's really no evidence that is what the brain is is doing, but that's perhaps another story. Okay, so Dr. Perv, just before we finish this interview, would you like perhaps to share with people where they can follow your work online and i don't know if you're also active on social media so anything that you would like to share with people about that yeah i'm not active on social media although i look at facebook once in a while um, i think the best way to see the things i'm talking about how they're explained the books and papers that are relevant and so on is to go on my uh, website my lab website, if you just type in on Google Purvis Lab, it takes you to it, and it's very easy to get as much detail as you could possibly want by doing that. The website is not bad, and I think it's one that's fun. It's interactive, and it's fun to look at. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Purvis, again, I would like to thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show today. Uh, and I really love your work, so keep on with it, and thank you for all. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a pleasure. It's always fun to talk to somebody who's thinking about these things, and you're obviously thinking about them pretty deeply. Thank you. Okay, thank you a lot. Hi, everybody. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel last February and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge. Any amount, even $1, would already be a great help. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Peralga Larson and Logorero. Thank you very much for all.